Hello, my name is Douglas Vanderhyde. I am a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, like my father before me, practicing here in New York. For the past 20 years, I have taught the dream course to psychoanalytic candidates, first at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, and later at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Education, which was recently renamed the Psychoanalytic Association of New York, or PANI. Until the end of his life, Sigmund Freud felt that his cracking the riddle of the dream counted as his greatest achievement. I would concur in that assessment, as discoveries about dream life are central to the development of psychoanalysis itself and remain crucial in any attempt to understand the working of the mind. In creating this brief video, I wish to honor those following Freud, including Ralph Greenson, Bertram Lewin, Hannah Siegel, Donald Meltzer, and Wilfred Bion, who themselves have appreciated the centrality of dreaming and through it have advanced our understanding of how we think, who we are, and what we desire. My hope is that this presentation on dreams may awaken, or perhaps reawaken, a kindred interest in the viewer and propel future psychoanalytic discovery. A noted psychoanalyst, Charles Brenner, once advised on presenting a paper, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Perhaps one slide at the beginning will suffice to introduce my topic. Psychoanalysis, the deepest and most efficacious mental treatment ever envisioned, began with the dream. This special mental act uniquely demonstrates key components of mental life, instinctual urges of sexuality and aggression, as well as defensive operations of repression or symbolic distortion, for which no theory of mind can hope to be complete without a satisfactory explanation. Dream analysis, to this day, remains the royal road to an appreciation of unconscious mentation in man, elucidating central inner conflict while facilitating its emergence in the therapeutic field. Knowing how to work with a patient's dream as a participant observer is, in my view, tantamount to knowing how to do good psychoanalytic and psychodynamic work. Such work is of unparalleled clinical value because it is experienced by the patient in his unconscious mind as a deeply loving act. Against the tide of our homogenized, exploited, and explained away lives, work with dreams, each forever irrational and intensely personal, affirms our professional commitment as therapists to validating, respecting, and protecting each patient's autonomy and unique mental life. I plan today to sketch out some of the grammar and syntax of dreams so that you can use dreams more effectively in your work, while hopefully considering further study, perhaps even the study of psychoanalysis itself. For most of my analytic life, I have felt a fascination with dreams, even while the dwindling number of articles on dreams in our analytic literature attests to a waning interest in them. I am somewhat puzzled by this trend, but I suspect currently we may be caught up in the heat of designing and redesigning newer theories of mind, leaving learning from the careful examination and analysis of individual mental productions to the side. The key word here is individual. You will hear this refrain many times in the course of this lecture. No dream is exactly like any other, just as no dreamer is like any other. And whatever difficulty that may cause to some meta-psychology enthusiasts, this fact alone should tell you that a person's dream life contains and uniquely reflects his core personal wishes, fears, and fantasies. Working with his dreams brings us immediately into an intimate relationship with our patient's inner world. You might ask, why is that so important? The answer is that no matter what theory or therapeutic approach we privilege, whatever we are able to accomplish with a patient is a product of a deeply personal exchange. 
In other words, enduring therapeutic success is dependent upon our patient's direct here and now apprehension of our care and concern for him, his unique conflicts, and his unique mind. The achievement of lasting change demands the patient's experience of our deep emotional penetration of their world. If you wish, you might visualize such empathic penetration as the tent pole of a developing shared mental space through which every patient grows regardless of theory or specific therapeutic technique employed. Later in this lecture, I will offer some ideas as to why I believe emotional interpenetration, if I may borrow that phrase from Steve Ellman, is so central to mutagenesis and lasting emotional growth. But for now, let's return to the dream. Throughout all our history, humans have had an intuitive sense of their importance, even when unable to decipher their meaning. You may recall from the Bible, Joseph and used Pharaoh's dream of the fat and lean kind to foretell the future. Dreams feel to us significant even as ideas about their purpose vary widely, from messages of a god or gods to conviction of impending illness, death, or life success. Ironically, or perhaps precisely because their meaning is internally registered as too disturbing, humans have attempted to explain them as noisy signals, the random firings of a brainstem, as per Alan Hobson, or the result of various physical ailments the previous night, or when all else fails, pass them off as silly and irrelevant, as in, it was just a dream. Despite such attempts, a person's dream is universally, by the dreamer, experienced as an extraordinary mental experience. Thrilling or mundane, vibrant or vague, absurd or uncanny, or even otherworldly, the dream, if it is remembered, will tug at the dreamer's mind with a special pull, as uniquely his own. Every dreamer is the screenwriter, producer, and director of his or her own dream. To quote Thomas Ogden, while dreaming, we are intuiting an element of our unconscious emotional lives and are at one with them in a way that differs from any other experience. To jump ahead for a moment, this fact alone is the first and almost most powerful intervention a therapist can make upon hearing any dream, that is, asking your patient, why this? I once began treatment with a man who had arrested for beating his wife. At his first session, he reported having dreamt the previous night that he was placed in handcuffs, but was able to slip out of them and yell to somebody standing nearby, don't you ever dare to put these things on me again. This patient had, in reality, already been arrested, already put in handcuffs, and released by the police the previous day. The event was over, so that putting himself back into handcuffs was, in effect, his acknowledgment of guilt for beating his wife, but possibly for a variety of other sins, known and unknown. In other words, one central dream meaning was, I am a bad man, and I deserve, I need to be arrested. Consistent with the ambivalence manifested in all of mental life, the dream equally demonstrated the fantasy his fantasy that no matter what the circumstances, he would be able to slip out of trouble and escape punishment. Finally, in addition to the representation of these opposing trends, as I will take up later, in recounting the dream to me, it additionally contained a wish or fantasy that I, as his analyst slash policeman, would help him regain control by putting him in irons while simultaneously daring me to do so. I will add that, as an aside, any law enforcement figure in any dream by a patient represents in some manner the dreamer's conscience or superego, and very frequently the therapist is put in that role. Once patients realize that we as therapists are open to hearing their dreams and regard them as meaningful and important mental acts, most are willing to recount them no matter how confused or irrational their content. Today, while underscoring the crucial role of dreams in the life of the mind, I wish to increase your appetite for them, to help you make sense of reported dream images, and perhaps most importantly, to boost your confidence in inviting and initiating a conversation with your patient about their remarkable polyvalent emotional significance. So, 
Here we go. If dreams are frequently irrational, I could hear someone say in this audience, what value can they have if I can't make sense of them? I want to stress at the outset that the core therapeutic value of working with any reported dream is independent of determining its meaning. In other words, the inquiry process alone is as precious at what, as whatever specific information can be obtained. One way of understanding this phenomenon is to appreciate that the recounting of a dream is akin to going to confessional and religious practices. Such an activity satisfies a universal desire to share oneself with a caring other who can potentially offer absolution, reprieve, and hope. But it is more than that. As emerges from the work of Bertrand Lewin, Donald Meltzer, and others, in the mind, via our perpetual use of symbol and metaphor, such activity reactivates an unconscious, embedded fantasy of being together with an internal, idealized breast mother. Your engagement with a patient's dream, like a parent's absorption in his or her child's fantasies and stories, is internally registered by the patient as an especially strong signal of unconditional love and care. Such is the brick and mortar of basic trust, if you will, and it is essential in my view for growth and change. Moreover, your comfort with material that feels irrational or even nutty to your patient indirectly promotes greater courage in him to know himself and to share himself with you. My presentation, to jump ahead a little, will be in three segments of approximately 15 minutes each. A brief history of dreams in early psychoanalytic thinking, a review of some of the important shifts in the psychoanalytic understanding of the nature of dreams and dream thoughts, and how an understanding of dreams can aid therapists in their daily work with patients. I apologize in advance for some of the denser theoretical aspects of this talk. To lighten things up a bit along the way, I will try to offer you relevant clinical examples from my own practice. Here he is. As many of you already know, psychoanalysis and dream interpretation were co-creations joined at the hip. It was in 1900 that Sigmund Freud published his Interpretation of Dreams, a book which, despite its formidable length and Germanic heaviness, contains many of Freud's postulates of mind. No effort to understand dreaming can be undertaken without a brief review of these assumptions. They are the existence of unconscious ideation, the pleasure principle, the reality principle, psychic dynamism, and the value of free association to unmask disguised unconscious wishes and ideas. Just to clarify, for those of you perhaps unfamiliar with these terms, some definitions are relevant here. Unconscious ideation meant for Freud not just that which is out of mind at a particular moment of time, but material which without considerable mental work remains permanently out of awareness. Whether one conceptualizes the unconscious as a quadrant of unacceptable repressed wishes or alternatively in some more contemporary conceptualizations, automatic unarticulated ways of being, it is inescapable that our earliest wishes, memories, fantasies, and relationships actively affect our everyday decisions and behaviors while themselves remain stubbornly in the shadows. Number two, the pleasure principle is linked to the preservation of homeostasis and refers to Freud's assumption that the primary aim of every human act, including mentation itself, is to obtain the maximal available gratification from any given situation. Pleasure arises hand in hand with the experience of a decrease in instinctual tension. The phrase that captures this urgency best is, I want what I want, and I want it now. This earliest form of thinking, wishing, Freud labeled the primary process, characterized at its core by a denial of time, logic, or external reality in its search for the quickest extinction of any instinctual urge. We will see later that this kind of thinking, mobile, illogical, symbolic, fluid is what dominates dream life, the playground par excellence of the central eternal child who exists within us all. 
The reality principle is, as it implies, the gradual awareness that the immediate effort to gratify certain wishes could be cataclysmic to the organism. Acceptance of the limits of the external world leads to rational thought, what Freud labeled the secondary process, an adult rational planning. Maturation and mental development itself are seen by classical psychoanalysts as the outcome of the inevitable clash between the primary process and secondary process, or an immediate wish coming up against an awareness of an increasingly complex and dangerous outside world. As a simple example, the baby at one year is hungry, he cries out, and mother comes with breast or bottle. The baby at 13 is hungry, realizes he is too old to cry, appreciates that his mother no longer comes anyway, decides to make himself a sandwich, and hopefully, over a period of time, gradually comes to realize the value of regular income and a steady job to provide for his needs. Number four, psychic dynamism. This implies that cause and effect are forever active in the mind. Ideas follow one on another, and no matter how seemingly disconnected or distant they may appear, psychoanalysts assume a conscious or an unconscious connection between those same ideas. Thus, the precise words used in describing a dream or reporting one need to be kept in mind even as the session moves to so-called other distant issues or matters. Having practiced for more than 30 years, I am still amazed at the degree to which words, expressions, or off-chance remarks seemingly miles from each other upon careful ideational and emotional exploration are discovered to be psychically intertwined in the mind of the utterer. Number five, free association is a technique that, as many of you may know, replaced hypnosis and capitalizes on the ubiquity of the above referenced psychic dynamism. Thus, a psychoanalyst, by encouraging his patient to just ramble on, can feel confident that in doing so, the patient will unwittingly communicate or by his silence demonstrate his unwillingness to communicate his desires, which are embedded in multiple symbolic forms av available to his mind. Freud's early and formative exposure to the phenomenon of post-hypnotic suggestion with Jean-Martin Charcot at the Salpetriere convinced him that patients knew a great deal more of their conflicts than they thought they did. Important pathogenic memories existed in a state which are absent from consciousness, but under the right conditions, whether by hypnosis or the pressure of his hand on their forehead while lying on a couch, could be recovered. Freud posited that those memories were stored in a particular part of the mind, which he called the pre-conscious, a region which he theorized was bordered on the one side by our conscious minds and on the other, a region of ever more unrecoverable mentation, which he called the unconscious. This is the so-called, let me take this out. This is the so-called topographic model, Freud's first model of the mind. You will note that a stimulus, this is called perception, so a stimulus arrives at the surface of the body or the surface of the mind here. It moves in this direction forward and goes from sensory input from this side to motor output on the other. In between, there is what Freud would constitute thinking. So a st stimulus occurs here, whether from within or without the body, disturbs the prevailing homeostasis, impinges on the mind, and forces the mind to do something. There is normally some slight delay before the individual performs an action that is intended to solve his problem. The delay between the stimulus on this side and motor output on that side is, in fact, thinking. Note that this model implies a movement forward in time, not just from stimulus on this side to motor on that side, right? but also forward as the patient accesses a series of memories of previous events that inform him as to how he should behave in response to that stimulus. These are basically Freud labeled mnemic traces and they were laid down from the earliest time forward and on its way through to a decision as to how to behave, these are recruited. 
Freud realized early in his work that discrete memories could be retrieved from the universal experience of infantile amnesia. This led him to assume that many, or perhaps most, of the earliest of experiences, trauma or later fantasy reconstruction, were only seemingly gone, but in actuality were immortalized somewhere in this part of the mind, the unconscious. While banished from conscious awareness, these events, desires, instinctual tensions, or as reformulated by neuroscientist Mark Soames, these action plans are always ready at hand, eager to break through the barrier of repression and express themselves as part of the handling of a current situation. I don't wish to belabor all this, but there are some interesting and important aspects of mental life highlighted by the topographic model. You will note that at the boundary of the preconscious and unconscious, that would be right there, okay? There is required a transfer of meaning from these earlier unconscious memories and fantasies of life, which themselves remain forever unavailable to consciousness, to that which is currently being attended to in the so-called preconscious, this semi-permeable area in an acceptably disguised form. You might want to think of George Washington's need under cover of night to cross the Delaware River in order to gauge the British. This is the original meaning of the term transference, which later became so closely associated with psychoanalytic and psychodynamic work. As initially conceived, it was merely the requirement that such a disguised transfer take place at the border between these regions of mind, of the unconscious and the preconscious, allowing an idea or feeling from the deepest past to reach the preconscious and through it to gain access to consciousness. Such a process inherently requires the use of simile, metaphor, or implied metaphor. In other words, some internal assessment that this new situation, which I can attend to, is or seems to be just like this other situation which I was forced to disavow and forget, but which still demands satisfaction. The requirement of a transference of meaning to reach consciousness clearly implies that any current relationship, as that with the therapist, would represent an opportunity for the satisfaction of disavowed wishes, which in Freud's model, eternally press for expression. Important to this talk on dreams is Freud's additional conclusion that the earliest of responses to a disturbing stimulus in a baby before the development of essentially any effective motor capacity was by way of a hallucination of satisfaction. It is apparent that one of the central requirements for every newborn infant is rest and sleep. Hence, the need to extinguish tension to allow added sleep, Freud posited as the very first wish and the dream was the first emergency plan to deal with the disturbance. So, if you look here, the little boy begins to urinate. And the governess holds him up and he starts a little stream. The stream gets to be a bit bigger, then quite a bit bigger, in fact, gets to be a river. Then ultimately we can see it gets to be a canal, then finally an ocean, an ocean liner, and at the last scene, the party's awake. Interestingly, this dream entitled The French Caretaker could work for both the baby and his caretaker, since both these images would allow the pleasure of additional time asleep. The baby by transiently ignoring the pressure of his bladder, the nurse by ignoring the increasing noise attending the baby's distress. Freud's topographic model has been likened to looking through a spyglass from the opposite end as in that it looks backward in time. You will note Freud's topographic model has been likened to looking through a spyglass from the opposite end in that it looks backward in time. For example, you're standing here, you look back to the beginning of all things. Right? You will note that normally, as we've said before, the action goes forward. There is a sensory input, there's a demand to do work, and there's an action plan which is affected. However, in sleep, 
this motor end plate is paralyzed. What happens instead is that in the creation of a dream, the st stimulus causes the creation of a dream, which since it cannot be discharged via motor activity, is turned backward and ends up as a new sensory experience, which is the dream itself. The special regressive aspect of dreaming on its way backward, like a magnet passing over iron filings, can be expected to represent earlier and earlier versions of relationships and wishes in life. It was for this reason that Freud was to claim that embedded in every dream is an infantile scene. Although our current understanding of treatment has been significantly and meaningfully reimagined, it is important to remember, as Morris Eagle pointed out, that Freud was a child of the Enlightenment. He felt, like many of his time, that if one could only find the inciting element of a neurosis, emotional catharsis and explication of the infantile situation would vastly diminish neurotic trends. For him, the notion was that there is a truth and if it is discovered, it shall indeed make you free. It led him to afford a special place for dreams in his psychology as he saw them as the royal road to the unconscious and to the seat of the action, or as he liked to put it, the source of the Nile. Part two. A review of the important shifts of psychoanalytic views on the nature of dream thoughts. For many years, psychoanalysis and dream interpretation were, as I've pointed out, synonymous. But gradually, with Freud's second psychological theory of tripartite model of id, ego, and superego, the dream fell into disfavor. Ego psychologists like Charles Brenner, mentioned earlier, and Jack Arlo argued that ordinary analytic data could be as revealing and helpful about unconscious conflict and that there was nothing special about dream material. The focus of therapy became increasingly on the transference and the relationship, fantasy and real, between patient and analyst. Elaborations of this relationship was seen as mutative, and the perceived relative importance of historic reconstruction of trauma, etc., and therefore of dreams, declined. But there were and remained analysts who saw in the creation of the dream a perspective on the nature of thinking itself. Gradually, we have moved away from some doctrinal effort to find in each dream a specific disguised wish or memory. Rather, we see on display in the dream and in the patient's subsequent associations the full complement of differing aspects of mind. Donald Meltzer, in his book Dream Life, points out that below our conscious, seemingly rational experience of life, a river of visual dream elements is always at work and flowing via the primary process attempting to resolve the central emotional issues of our lives. In effect, the dream poetically reveals mind as a constant inner meaning generating machine which is forever evaluating new phenomena or concerns through the use of metaphor and simile hidden under a facade of the secondary process of logic and reason. Just as our view of the dream has widened and in many ways been freed up, so too have our perspectives on treatment and mutagenesis. Psychoanalysts no longer attempt to discover a troubled infantile past, to triumph over it. Rather, we help the patient discover it, explore it in fantasy via the transference, and allow for its gradual transformation and maturation into its unique, mature adult form. With insight and interpretation grounded in our relatedness to the patient, we help him e increasingly encompass all his possible wishes, sacred and profane, without condemnation or reproach. We do this with the confidence that they will ultimately, these wishes, commingle reducing the need to banish unacceptable split-off choices or split-off states of mind, thereby allowing for more gratifying compromise solutions to the problems of living and being. The former clear separation between states of wakefulness and that of sleeping and dreaming is now so blurred that many contemporary psychoanalysts speak of a waking dream thought. We dream while we are awake as much as asleep, but are only less able to access the dream content because of the need to perform a job, drive a car, do mathematics, or taxes. 
So then, how are dreams different from the state of wakefulness? I have picked eight central points which I will review with you now. In dreams, there is a virtual total reliance on hallucination in the visual world. Such sense organs as hearing, smell, taste, and touch play no significant role. The spoken and written word normally play a very negligible one. Two, images are generated that can morph in ways that are largely prohibited in waking life. Some images are literally indescribable and can be an amalgamation of several different objects, each of which in the dream may have a specific dream meaning. This highlights the intense condensation of multiple themes and meanings that is regularly observed in dreams. Number three, there's an immediacy about dream images. The dreamer may transiently be able to pull back and reassure himself with some thought that this is only a dream, but in the main, dream images are experienced as real in a manner totally foreign to the experience of fantasy or so-called daydreaming while in an awake state. Number four, Whatever the ideational chain, the dream has no recourse to punctuation. As Ella Freeman Sharp makes clear in her book, Dream Analysis, this means that relationships must be visually represented. If you and I agree or are allies, we can be pictured next to each other. If opposed, the dreamer might describe a dream character as sitting across from him. Number five. In keeping with our deeper understanding of projective identification, often each character in the dream manifests elements of both the dreamer and his subject. For example, a man dreams of trying to escape a dinosaur. In some way, he is both the poor victim who is running for his life and the dinosaur who wishes to consume and destroy. Number six, to emphasize a matter of special emotional relevance, the dream will frequently use repetition of images, scenes, or the entire dream. This is especially true for dreams which contain representations of childhood trauma and the mind's ceaseless effort to bind associated painful affects into a dream representation that can offer revelation, solution, and comfort. The most striking difference between sleep and wakefulness is, of course, that the body is paralyzed. Ignoring somnambulism, the dreamer is safely in bed. If a dream is too distressing, the patient will awake from a surfeit of anxiety. But otherwise, death, intercourse, birth, murder, every possible mental experience can be represented in a dream with nothing more than rapid eye movement taking place in the physical body of the dreamer. Number eight. The raison d'être of dreams is the reestablishment of emotional homeostasis. Research in sleep laboratories have demonstrated an inverse relationship between dreaming and a need to seek pleasure or satisfaction while awake. When contented, subjects demonstrate a reduction in the need for sleep and REM activities, whereas individuals, when sleep deprived, exhibit an increased need for pleasurable experiences, almost in compensation. Such findings support the notion that dreams serve a key soothing function and that dreams are never about trivial matters. Even if your patient dreams of an evening bowling, do not be misled by the indifferent content. He may well be worried about being bowled over. As an aside, in this dream image, note the concreteness in the dream word link which we would never utilize in waking adult life, but which the child might well seize on when first hearing the words bowled over and visualize the pins as they go flying. Every trivial dream exists because of some link between that which is of no consequence and that which is. Frequently matters that are too distressing to dream are often dealt with in this way. For example, a man with a recurrence of his cancer might dream of catching a cold or a 24-hour intestinal disturbance. A guilty woman who is considering infidelity might dream of being stopped for a speeding ticket. Matters are magnified or trivialized as needed to titrate the internal anxiety to a level that allows a dream to be created and dreamt. This is perhaps the primary reason for so-called distortion in dreams. Too little disguise renders a nightmare or an absence of dreaming or sleeping altogether. Yet another reason for the distortion in dreams is, as I have previously remarked, that they are immensely concentrated and frequently contain a remarkable number of issues that are dealt with as one. It has been said that the first dream in an analysis, if fully analyzed, would encompass all the pertinent themes of the entire analysis. 
So then, what are the core common themes and how are they represented in dream material? Again, you will find an arbitrary list of six such themes, whereas I could say in truth anything and everything such a statement would be exceedingly unhelpful. So I will parse out some areas that they may light up in your mind as you hear a dream in your own practice. Number one, early bodily desires. Freud focused on sexual desire and the associated issues of guilt and incest vis-a-vis -vis parental figures, but drive representatives of aggression, as well as other bodily experiences of pain, sexual desire, hunger, thirst, fatigue, can and all do find representation in dream material. Number two, self-image and ego strength. Dreams almost invariably reveal the patient's own sense of who he is and what his capabilities are at any one time. A dream of a capsizing boat or airplane should trigger concerns about your patient feeling overwhelmed by life events, perhaps even by the treatment itself. As an aside, treatment is frequently represented <coughs> in dreams as a voyage or a journey. A dream of success in a competitive arena or a dreamer who wins out and does okay in competition is certainly suggestive of possible narcissistic worries, but in general a decent outcome in a dream struggle speaks to an internal sense of flexibility and capacity. I will give you an example of such a dream a bit later. Number three, guilt and moral turpitude. Dreams virtually always contain some reference to issues of conscience. Frequently, they are dreamt to represent or confess to internal attitudes and behaviors that in an awake state are denied or swept away. Often dreams of this sort can utilize images of dirt or dirty laundry. Lady Macbeth's spot comes to mind. I had one patient whose debilitating rage at her parents and the world was represented for years by malfunctioning toilets overflowing with feces. Note here the combination of rage, the pouring out of all this feces, and self-punishment. She can't get rid of it, and it ends up soiling her. Overtly masochistic outcomes in dreams usually signal a need for punishment for internally experienced sins and crimes. Four, mood and affect. These are often the most puzzling, and on the surface least in sync with the underlying material. Why this is so, I don't think has been ever adequately explained. But normally affects are muted in dreams other than in nightmares, and significant feeling tone is often unavailable until the dream is unpacked with the therapist. This is yet another important reason to work with dreams, namely to liberate and reach important, frequently obscure, problematic but, but embedded feeling tone. Number five, core relationships. People dream of their relation to others, because the people they hate and love and those that hate and love them are of primary concern. It is the rare dreamer who is not concerned with another in his or her world. I had a very traumatized patient whose mother was emotionally unavailable and whose father was an explosive and disturbed man. One of his earliest dreams in analysis was of putting red shaded spheres or eggs in their proper slots on a grid. I surmised, via the color red, that he suffered from enormous suppressed rage. You might not be surprised to hear that he grew up on a farm, works as a scientist, and prefers to isolate himself in a lab. The central point I am making is that the absence of another in the dream is probably indicative of significant emotional difficulty interacting with others. Number six, treatment and transference. Psychoanalysis and dynamic psychotherapy almost exclusively utilize the element of transference to affect insight and change. As I have previously tried to underscore, childhood experiences and the unconscious anticipation of the behavior of parental figures enter into the treatment field willy-nilly, and that is especially true in dream life. Every current dream a patient recounts is in some measure about the past and the present, but usually also concerns the two of you. This is particularly true with a case of increasing contact, more sessions per week, or a deepening treatment. Knowledge of that unconscious or partly conscious relationship, often most clearly discernible via the dream, is of immeasurable value in refining your role and the work you intend to pursue with your patient. For instance, a patient of mine at the onset of treatment was intensely hyper-emotional, subject to bouts of self-cutting, depression, and severe alcoholism. She had hinted at serious sexual trauma perpetrated by someone in her immediate family. One could anticipate that the combination of terror and excitement would enter the treatment via her fantasies of me. 
Later, you will hear a dream from the termination phase of this very successful analysis. But night after night, this patient dreamt of her escape, escape from prison camps in North Korea, Burma, and of course, Nazi Germany. You might ask, why of course? But my last name should give you a strong clue, given the similarity between the Dutch and German languages. Such a dream underscored the level of mistrust and anticipated danger and excitement she felt in working with me. Its content helped me to see how much preliminary work on elaborating her fears was needed and alerted me to the, her propensity to be unintentionally dishonest, affect compliance while secretly planning her escape. Another patient of mine dreamed in the initial sessions of being in an out-of-control vehicle careening wildly. Association to the dream led to his idea of being imprisoned in a white van. Again, my last name should suggest his concern, and again demonstrates the tie to journey or travel, how that relates to treatment. In addition, the white van contained potential references to race and religion, but these were not a workable focus at the time. This underscores also that a fully elaborated or analyzed dream occurs rarely in psychotherapy or analysis, and a variety of themes remain mysterious and unexplored for a long period of time. But that does not diminish what the dream can teach you in the now about your patient's current life and his experience of working with you. At the risk of being tendentious, I would reiterate that dreams are almost always triggered by and constructed to visually represent some current situation or critical life problem. This underscores the importance of asking when a dream occurred, the so-called day residue. This is a simple intervention that is nevertheless frequently overlooked by even experienced clinicians. The night before an exam, the night after sex, the day after promotion, the night after a breakup, or the day after a stormy therapy session will invariably find representation in the dream creation and offer clues to its latent meaning. We human beings live in ambivalence. To explain why this is so would take us too far afield. But the need to suppress one set of feelings in favor of another is a cause for significant neurotic misery. Dream analysis frequently demonstrates meanings that contradict the so-called official version. For those of you old enough to remember, the old Soviet TASS version. Exploration of dream images can often challenge the prevailing narrative and offer a chance to explore eschewed areas of mentation. To grasp the hidden meaning of a dream, one must be alert to every kind of potential reversal or substitution. Small can be big, high can mean low, on multiple levels. Action can be reversed between characters. Aggression can represent love and the reverse. <laughs> what this means for you as the listener is that you must resist quick judgment and be comfortable with uncertainty. Any attempt to definitively state the meaning of any dream should be avoided. As I have said, the dream is most closely aligned with child thinking. To work successfully with dreams is partially surrender to the child mind, to consider and allow for anything and everything. Popeye is small, as are children. He is threatened by bully Bluto. He eats the right vegetable that makes him the strongest man in the world. Roadrunner is not eaten by the wolf, but gets his eternal revenge by dropping a safe on the plotting evil wolf, etc. I was recently told a dream of a depressed woman who was entering analysis. She dreamt I was on a submarine. On one end was low and the other high, and I was on the high side and offered my hand to Anne, a friend of the patient who was on the low side. Here, reversals again play a large role. The patient felt, in fact, underwater and, in order to feel in control, reverses the action, having her help N, or perhaps her analyst, rather than the other way around. Note that issues of bravery and interest to explore new subterranean worlds coexist with her fear as she considers a budding trust in the analyst. All are represented in this dream. So, how do dreams help the treatment? Nobody talks about the abhorred corrective emotional experience of Franz Alexander. But almost all analysts appreciate, as Freud stated, that you cannot kill or embrace anyone in effigy. Change requires a new here and now experience. Exploration of the past by itself frequently remains anthropologic and fundamentally unhelpful. 
We know that the quality and timber our patients experience in their initial encounters with the world are automatically triggered if you remember the topographic model, and then superimposed on every ostensibly new life event. But if we can all agree that change results from a new experience, given what we know of the mind and the incessant reverberation of transference, how do we actually have one? Think of the dreams I have just related, your awareness and exploration of the newest additions of imagined danger in the treatment situation, Prison camps, careening, careening autos, drowning, or claustrophobia helps reassure your patient and constitutes by the privileging of his emotional life the beginning of the establishment of what many have called basic trust. Contemporary analysts rightly highlight a renewed and revitalized faith in the benign and loving interest of the therapist as central to any analytic or dynamic work and credit the exploration and working through of early fantasies of danger or psychic pain in this new setting as key to starting one's emotional life. So in part three, how do we work with dreams? Number one is ask for them. I will give you some suggestions as to how to bring that up. Number two, ask the patient for his associations and thoughts, both to the dream as a whole as well as to individual dream elements. Number three, consider the day residue and the current life situation, including the situation in the treatment. Number four, focus on one or two striking dream elements and uh, ask uh, the, for the patient's elaboration. Number five, have some notion as to what you want to determine. And number six, admit when you're flummoxed. I hope in the preceding sections about the nature of dreaming, I have already indirectly offered you some methods to use when hearing a dream. In this third and last section, I do not intend to provide a cookbook set of instructions to you, but there are a few do's and don'ts that are, can be helpful, and I will review them here. The first and perhaps most important suggestion is to find a way to ask about your patient's dreams. One way I start is to say something like, you are here to change X and Y. We are using A and B techniques to accomplish these goals. However, we know that these symptoms, habits, and repeated relationships have deep roots, and efforts to change or alter them can stir up powerful feelings. While undergoing this treatment, it is possible you may have a dream related to the work that we are doing. I would be interested if you have any and would encourage you to recount them to me. Dreams are important and can often shed light on matters that may affect the course of your treatment here. Such a statement is often enough to have the patient remember a dream immediately or perhaps have one occur before the next meeting. So let's say a patient reports a dream. Let's take the scenario of a dream of indifferent character, no particular storyline, and little feeling to, tone to guide the way. It's always best to wait for the patient's spontaneous associations. When none are forthcoming, and only then, consider asking one or two general questions, such as, what night of the week did this dream occur? Or, on the day before the dream, did anything unusual happen, or anything that might be related to the dream images? So let's say the patient reports a dream. Let us take the scenario of a dream of an indifferent character, no particular storyline, and little feeling tone to guide the way. It is always best to wait for the patient's spontaneous associations. When none are forthcoming, as may happen from time to time, and only then, consider asking one or two general questions, such as, what night of the week did the dream occur? On the day before the dream, did anything unusual happen or anything that might be related to the dream images? What was the feeling in the dream, or even the feeling after awakening? Or lastly, can you think of any reason why you might have had this dream at this time? One other question that you can ask yourself is how might the dream images be representative of you and your patient in your work together? Once a patient recounts a dream, you might consider asking if it is indeed the whole dream. Often patients may wake up and break off one dream to begin another. As you might expect now via psychic determinism, the second dream is most often a furtherance of the first dream thought. In my experience, patients may offer only the dream which seems the most superficially coherent, keeping them more confused, but actually more revealing second dream to themselves unless asked. While listening to a dream, 
It is important to allow yourself to be immersed in it. What do the images provoke in you? Do you have an emotional reaction to the dream? When you do have a strong reaction to the manifest content of the dream, that would be the most important thing to comment on after asking for the patient's ideas and feelings and before exploring other interesting aspects of the dream or dream images. For instance, one of my patients reported in her first dream that she dreamt being repeatedly penetrated genitally with knives and scissors. Contrast that to another patient of mine who dreamt that she was at some beach and she remembers there were some various people there whom she didn't recognize standing around. She wasn't sure what was happening, but she noticed a blue beach ball. You probably didn't have much of a reaction to the second dream, but perhaps a fair amount to the first. When a dream causes you to feel suffused with feeling, in my view, it is beneficial to reflect your experience even when it is unclear if the emotion manifest in the dream is the real feeling tone or is even shared by your patient. I said to the first patient after asking for her association, that seems like one scary dream. How did this come to mind? I would ignore for the moment, but not forget the possibility that what is presented as horrific might equally represent an activity of guilty desire. As a further aside, pay attention to the words used in the reporting of the dream. Note the phrase knives and scissors, which at least strikes my ear as odd or perhaps even quaint. Such scissors are prominent in fairy tales like Snow White and vaguely hint at genetic or perhaps historical significance. In other words, perhaps the phrase is an allusion to a fantasy or distorted memory generated very early in life. In the second instance of the beach dream, I would ask my generic questions, and then if nothing of substance is found, I would attempt to have the patient associate to one striking dream element. Remember, the dream mind does not deal in the generic. You can be certain that an unadored beach has been scrubbed clean by defense, so we need to ask about it. To borrow an example from Ella Freeman Sharp, her patient said, I dreamt of a pirate. The needed query was, which pirate? The answer is Captain Hook, then all kinds of allusions to little boys who have sp spectacular erotic capacities, meaning ones who can fly, who fight with older men, and who worry about bodily injury and castration immediately come to mind. Do not be uneasy if the ensuing discussion seems to veer away from the dream itself. The related unearthed issues will continue to be elaborated in your patient's mind and may emerge at some point later, either in the session or perhaps in yet another dream. I cannot in this one lecture provide an encyclopedia on dream interpretation, but I would emphasize in these closing minutes that a dream is almost always useful as a self-image. As you may know, in the termination phase of any analysis, there is a temporary but often disturbing and unsettling upsurge in the original symptoms. This has a great deal to do with leaving you and can be understood as a repetition of leaving the original loved objects. People who have improved vastly as a result of treatment have a tendency, on the one hand, to wish to present themselves as super healthy in order to feel adult and ready to take charge of their lives, or on the other, to exaggerate their difficulties in order to demand further care and to postpone indefinitely the pain of saying goodbye. As a result, it is sometimes hard to know when to terminate. To return to my self-cutting depressed patient who did so well, I will now relate a dream she had in the closing days of her tenure analysis. I had another dream last night. I was with my cousin B. He's my Scandinavian cousin. We were going to take a high hang glider trip, and we were on the top of a mountain, and we jump off. And the assumption is that it's just going to know where it needs to go automatically. And suddenly I realized that wasn't true, and I didn't know how to fly it. So I said to B, okay, you fly it. And he said, I don't know anything about this. I looked to see that we were headed for a forest and we needed to do something right away. I mean, if we landed in the forest, you know, we maybe would be injured or anyway would be far away and be lost. Somehow, I maneuver it to land in a safe, unforested area. These are the patient's spontaneous thoughts on, about the dream. My first thought is that B reminded me of X, a male family member suspected of sexual abuse. Then I thought, maybe it was you. I mean, they're both about your height. They were both fair, slim, and tall. 
At first I thought it was sort of a positive dream. I mean, there I was taking control of a hang glider. But you know, then it's kind of negative. I mean, I may get us out of harm's way, but far from town or village. And maybe it's not a very positive picture anyway. I had an anxiety that bad things would happen as I was flying. One dream, like the saying about a picture, can indeed tell you the whole story. I don't need to tell you anything more about her dream beyond that she and a tall, blonde, thin man, maybe her cousin, go hang gliding and jump off a mountain. Initially, she is frightened when she realizes that she must fly it and might lose control, but finally she deals with having to fly it on her own and lands it safely. In her associations, my patient tries to emphasize her anxiety and indirectly asserts that she's not ready to fly on her own, but the dream image of successfully hang gliding and the implied exhilaration associated with these images made me confident of her capacity to go forward without me. Of course, in the sessions, there were other clues to her enlarged emotional capabilities, but in the vividness of the dreamscape, we see her new self-image. This is a person who feels a new inclination to challenge herself, to do thrilling and dangerous and sexy things, and who, while scared of a future and a potential crash, is ready to take on the challenge while feeling herself capable of landing safely. Judicious use of the dream depends sometimes upon an appreciation of the task at hand. I was focused on ascertaining my patient's internal emotional competence. But the dream image equally represents a regressive and very meaningful wish that she could make me a member of her family. And then, of course, we would never have to part. So in summary, why dreams? To my mind, dreams are important because they are, in the most vibrant, alive, and creative way, our true soul. They are the repository of our most human of selves, our unadorned hopes, fears, and desires. They are essential to mental health. In their disguised form, they represent a vital internal conversation with us and with the internalized parental figures who love us most about those issues at the center of our lives. I hope this talk may help you feel a greater measure of comfort and skill in understanding them and appreciating their clinical usefulness. I hope as well that you will consider psychoanalytic training where dreams and the workings of the unconscious are explored, helping you become immeasurably more sophisticated and experienced in your work. Whatever theory of wars abound in our field, psychoanalysis continues to offer patients an unparalleled opportunity to restructure and reground their mental lives. The resultant new psychic peace the ability to love and feel deeply the joy and ordinary happiness of life are the greatest of gifts and provide lasting satisfaction to the giver. Thank you for your time and attention.